having a moment, uh, the privilege of introducing uh, someone who in this crowd probably needs no introduction, which is uh, my predecessor, BZBI's Rabbi Emeritus, Ira Stone. Um, I want to just a little bit of housekeeping as we're getting started um, about uh, Zoom etiquette for people who um, are less, maybe haven't participated in uh, online classes um, yet. Um, the, uh, if you would keep yourself on mute, um, there is, you should be able to see somewhere a button that says raise hand. Um, and uh, you can use that raise hand button to indicate uh, to the presenter or one of the hosts that you'd like to unmute and say something, or it may be um, that whoever's teaching will ask a question and will invite people to unmute and answer the question. Um, but uh, please, at pretty much at all times, keep yourself on mute, because uh, that will ensure that we can hear our presenters and not be hearing whatever uh, background noise might be happening at your end of the connection. Um, I also want to uh, just let everyone know, if you missed it, uh, that BZBI is beginning online Shabbat services this week on Saturday morning. Um, and as this Saturday is the second day of Shavuot, uh, that service will include Yisker. We're beginning at our regular 930 time. Um, I, we don't ever quite know exactly when Yisker is going to be, but it'll be sometime after 10 o'clock. Um, so I'd say definitely be there by 10 uh, if you want to be sure not to miss Yisker. And um, now I'm going to uh, welcome Rabbi Iris Stone, uh, BZBI's Rabbi Emeritus and a a uh, world-renowned teacher of Musar and Jewish philosophy to uh, open our Tikkun Leil Shavuot this evening. Oh yeah, Thank sorry. You. Okay, great. Uh, so before you start, Rabbi Stone, I've been uh, I've been asked by my lovely wife to uh, give everyone the full schedule for the evening. Um, so um, after uh, Rabbi Stone's shiur on radical humanism. Uh, we will have a short break for people to um, use the facilities or get food or whatever you need. Um, at nine o'clock, uh, we have Anne Albert, who uh, Anne is on the call here. Um, Anne is the Director of Public Programs at the Katz Center for Advanced Jewish Studies at Penn. Uh, and she will be teaching uh, hashtag pray from home um, about home-based synagogues uh, throughout Jewish history. At uh, 10 o'clock, our associate rabbi, Annie Lewis, will teach on uh, faces, masks, and divine light. And my teaching on visions of redemption will begin around 11 o'clock. Uh, and now, with no further to do, I uh, will turn things over to you, Rabbi Stone. And Chag Sameach to everyone. Um, so, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do tonight is very possibly not doable, but I'm going to try anyway. Um, I want to introduce you to one of the great rabbinic figures of the um, uh, of, of the um, um, 18th, 19th century, and um, I always get, you know I always get confused with 1700. So, so that's the, the from the middle of the 18th century to the middle of the 19th century. Uh, Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin. And um, in part, my, my um, rationale for introducing you to this rabbi and his work is precisely because I think it is so incredibly radical. Uh, and it will, um, I hope, uh, sound somewhat familiar to those of you who have been exposed to more, much more modern Jewish thought. Um, even postmodern Jewish thought. Uh, and so there is a, uh, one of the goals that I have is to um, shed some light, if you will, on the fact that what we take to be very modern ideas about theological issues in Judaism uh, are not necessarily as modern as they seem, that in fact, in the, in the so-called pre-modern world of Jewish thought, there was a great deal of um, creativity, great deal of questioning, uh, a great deal of theorizing um, that lies below the surface, which we often simply describe as being orthodox or fundamentalist or literalist. Um, there is that, of course, 
there are those in the traditional Jewish community who are literalists, who are fundamentalists. Um, but frankly speaking, I don't think that they're that much different from people even in the non-Orthodox community. That is, simplistic ideas about God, simplistic ideas about major theological issues are not the sole possession of one um, um, type of Jew or another, uh, but rather uh, are quite common even Is the rabbi frozen on everybody's screen? Uh, yeah, I think we are we have had some trouble with our connection to Rabbi Flynn, so let's give a minute for him to reconnect. It was such a profound thought. We needed the moment to, you know, meditate. Yeah, I have a plan B to uh, go to the next topic. <laughs> uh, just bear with, because it when he dropped out, it looks like he is reconnecting. Um, and okay. uh, and if you can hear me, um, if you could just flip your video on. Oh, okay. you're here. Okay, uh, I'm here. So, and we, we may. If we don't get Rabbi Stone back in a minute, I'm going to ask you to uh, to move up your timing and start teaching, if that's all right. And shit. Okay, I got it. Okay, uh, so we're just going to we're just going to uh, another. Oh, here oh. and back. Hello, Rabbi Stone. A miracle. Sorry, my computer just. I think the the uh, sheer brilliance of the of this group just uh, kicked it offline. Um, so now I have to get back to my notes, which were on the computer that crashed. And uh, as soon as I do that, I can continue. Uh, I may have to do some fooling around to find my place in them. Okay. All right. So um, without further ado then, so I don't waste any more of time. Um, can you hear me? Okay, um, I'm speaking about Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin, uh, and a little bit of background as to who he was. Uh, he was born in 1749, died in 1821. Uh, his real name was Chaim, I believe, Yitzkowitz, though nobody ever calls him that. He is called Chaim of Volozhin. 
Jacob's father was also the rabbi in Vilajan, a small town outside of Vilna. And without going into all the detail about how brilliant he was, at a certain point after studying uh, at home and then studying with other rabbis, he applied to study with the Gaon of Vilna uh, and was accepted. <clears throat> and not, um, not a small thing. Right? The Gaon of Vilna was the greatest scholar of uh, 18th century Lithuania, and Lithuania was the center of Jewish scholarship in the world at that point. Uh, and the Gaon uh, took few students, but uh, Chaim of Vilajan was one of them. And Chaim really became his um, primary student and stayed with him until the Gaon died. During the time <clears throat> that he was with the Gaon of Vilna, he had an idea for creating a new institution in Jewish life, which today we recognize as the yeshiva. Now, not that yeshivot didn't exist in the past, uh, particularly the great yeshivot of Babylonia, but for the most part in European Jewish culture up until the middle or late, really the end of the um, 17th century, uh, there were no major yeshivot. That was not the locus of Jewish education. Uh, a, a student would attend the cheder, he would uh, probably by the age of 12, 11 or 12, he would probably end his Jewish studies, maybe 13 if he was lucky, <clears throat> unless he was either relatively wealthy or um, truly showed promise as a student, in which case he would generally be taken on as a private student by some well-known rabbi, maybe first the rabbi of the village and then eventually another rabbi uh, in a larger city. But the idea of people going to a school was uh, relatively new, absolutely new actually, in the, um, in the community. And Chaim of Olajan had this idea that he could bring together uh, in an institution, in a building, students of high quality uh, who would be supported by the institution. In other words, they would be given scholarships, they would get food and, and board, they would get clothing, and they would live at the yeshiva, and they would learn uh, as a group uh, and the learning they would do was primarily in the style, so to speak, of the Gaon of Vilna, um, which was intense and um, a deep, if you will, Talmudic studies, as opposed to a more surface approach to covering a lot of pages. Uh, in the Gaon of Vilna style, one really could stay on the same page of Talmud for weeks or months at a time, milking it for everything that it was worth um, and uh, in investigating it within the whole complex web of, of Jewish literature around a particular issue. So it was really a revolutionary institution and it set the tone for the yeshiva world that developed out of it, uh, particularly in the 19th and into the 20th century. Uh, the, the yeshiva at, uh, at Vajan, uh, was in existence for over 90 years. Bitch. Uh, from, hello? From 1803 until 1892, um, when it was ultimately uh, closed um, because of pressure from the Russian government to, um, um, to begin to include um, um, secular studies. Uh, which uh, the yeshiva resisted. Any case, that's the claim to fame institutionally uh, of Rabbi Chaim of Arashim. And in fact, it is a major claim to fame in that it shaped the world of Orthodox Judaism and continues to shape the world of Orthodox Judaism, Judaism till today. The other major claim to fame, however, of Rabbi Chaim of Arashim is a book. The book is called Nefesh HaChayim, uh, literally the soul of Chaim. It was published just after his death, posthumously by his son. And it is one of the most comprehensive, clear expositions of Kabbalistic theology and the, um, the consequent ethical and moral and religious values founded on Kabbalistic philosophy. Um, in part, Chaim of Volozhin was reacting to the growth of Hasidism, which he, uh, along with 
of Gaon of Vilna uh, opposed. And, um, and yet, in his opposition to uh, Hasidut, primarily, in my opinion, because Hasidut threatened to make the secrets of Kabbalah um, public, Chaim of Varazhin, in a sense, was forced to make the secrets of Kabbalah public himself, but in a context that he so felt... Good night. Could, and you have a bit outside, hardly at all. Um, that he felt he could control, right? Um, so it is, a, um, it is a, a, um, an extraordinary book um, that spends a great deal of time answering or ex explicating the, uh, and, and this, could be, this could be said to be the fundamental theme of the book, explicating the, the very um, profound verse in the Torah that human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. In a certain sense, Rabbi Chaim asked and, and, and profoundly explored the question, what does it mean to be created in the image and likeness of God, right? So in a couple of seconds, I'm gonna put up on the screen a little bit of text, which I'd like to, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to look at. But I wanna give you a quick overview of the, of the Kabbalistic philosophy that guides um, Rabbi Chaim's vision. So uh, in the, and, and I'm, oh, I'm generalizing, right? There are all kinds of uh, the, the minor disputes among Kabbalists like you would expect, but this is a general view of Kabbalah as it emerges out of the world of uh, medieval Jewry, right? So number one, um, the idea that there is, that God is a being that sits on top of the world and controls it is rejected, right? Uh, rather, in place of that vision, or to be more specific, um, that vision is seen as a simplification of the more profound note idea that, that the divine, what, what, it, what the Kabbalah, call, Kabbalah calls the Ein Sof, the infinite, right, the without end, the, the Ein Sof is entirely incomprehensible, total mystery. You're not even allowed, according to Rav Chaim, to ask questions about what the Ein Sof is or isn't, because no answer in human language could in, the, in, in any way um, articulate the reality of the Ein Sof, right? It's totally transcendent. Yet, as part of its mystery, the Ein Sof spills out over itself and creates a, again, this is a metaphor, but creates a system of lights, L-I-G-H-T-S, lights, right? Um, and these lights then have within them a kind of, you might say, almost genetic structure, which evolve downward, and the light becomes more and more, well, I'm sorry, becomes less and less refined as it, as it evolves until it reaches the bottom of the evolutionary ladder, which is us. Uh, us in a general way, not just human beings, but the material world, the world of the earth, the sky, the, the etc. Now, all of this is, of course, derived from biblical verses, which I don't have time to go into, right? When the Bible opens, God saw, God, you know, um, that in the beginning God created and, and, and the first thing that he created is light. So that becomes the catalyst for this kind of mythology. But the important part here is, is, is that, um, that the system evolves downward. Each level of, uh, is less refined than the level above it until you get to the least refined level, which is the level of the material world, right? But then these lights or the bottom of the lights, which are now the, the top of the, 
of the evolutionary chain, which is called Keter, the crown. This Keter um, uh, precipitates a second creation, if you will. Then this creation does not go by, does not evolve, uh, devolve downward, but rather does an end run around all of the worlds and levels that have been created by the original process and, and lands and inserts itself directly into the human being. And that is called the breath of God. Right? So when God breathes into the human being that is created in the Genesis story, according to the Kabbalists, the, the level of Keter has taken the most highest level of holy energy and without allowing it to become less refined, right? It's still as refined as it was at the top. It goes all the way down to the bottom and gets put into us and is called the nishama, the soul, or the breath. And more importantly, this act of ensouling the human being with the breath of the divine is understood as an action by which the divine transfers responsibility for powering the cosmos to the human being, right? as you'll see in the text, literally. God, using God as a, as a placeholder for this whole system. This whole system now, um, um, the energy of this whole system is now lodged at the bottom in us. I like to think of it as kind of a trans, we are, we are acting in the universe as transformers, right? The energy of God, if you will, the energy, the divine energy of the cosmos is so powerful that, um, that nobody, not, that nothing but the human being can imbibe it. And the human being's job as a way, in a way, is to transform that energy and send it back up. And by sending the energy back up, it gives life to the entire cosmos. Therefore, human beings are literally responsible for the maintenance of the cosmos. And how do they do that? Well, as you might suspect, they do it by doing good. Because this, this light that originally started at the top of this process is, is, con is conceived of as being pure goodness. So pure goodness suffuses the entire cosmos and it, and, it, and it evolves downward to the material world. And it also goes around this whole evolutionary process and lodges itself within the human being, who then is responsible for transforming this energy through his or her actions and sending it back up. At which point, interestingly enough, by sending the energy back up, it it, um, it precipitates more energy coming out of the divine going down. So we control the cosmos and we ultimately control even the, the, the divine God, God self, right? We determine how God is going to respond to the universe. Um, so that's the general theology very simply stated, and I, I, I apologize if that's not simple enough. But before I go on to the text, let me ask if anyone has a question on that partic this particular s schema, whether it makes sense or whatever. Rabbi, it's Barbara. Does this only apply to humans? In other words, what about other entities in the cosmos, animals, that kind of thing. Is this only a human concept? Yeah, I mean, animals have, this is an issue that comes up every time I teach this. I mean, everybody today is worried about the animals. Well, I mean, I'm not, think, I'm just asking. 
<laughs> I don't think Rabbi Chaim of Arjun was all that worried about animal souls. Okay. But that said, the, the fact of the matter is that the animals, there are two words for soul, at least, right? One is neshama and one is nefesh, right? So nefesh is a soul in the sense of animation, right? So animals have a nefesh, but they don't have a neshama. Uh-huh. Okay. Right? Yep. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. So, which I think, generally speaking, comports with our understanding of the animal world. They have some kind of soul, and they have some kind of consciousness, but it is clearly not the same as human consciousness. And I'd like to kind of leave it at that. Okay. Right? If we ever learn that animals are actually smarter than us, then we can re we can revisit. Samuel, you have a question. Well, you said. Um... You use the word control. We can control the upper worlds, but but can we really? The book doesn't really talk more about um, elevating the upper souls, not controlling it, but but raising it up and moving souls from the lower part of the of the upper worlds even higher. Uh, yes, but I would not um, I would not shy away from the use of control. First of all we not only can lift up the upper worlds, we can bring them down. Right? So human actions, human activity can destroy the cosmos or at least destroy elements of the cosmos, right? Um, as well as lift it up. Um, and there is pretty clear language in the book that suggests that in a certain sense, the divine is a mechanical process. And in this mechanical process, we play the animating role. So I'm not sure whether you want to call that control or something else. Maybe we can look at the text and talk about that. Any other comments or questions? Hi. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, when you use the word refine, can you just kind of uh, explain that a little more? Is that, is that something that, like the uh, this, the uh, light becomes more diffuse and uh, harder to see or something? Or what do you mean by uh, it yeah. gets less refined? It becomes more and more, it becomes thicker and thicker until it actually becomes material, right? It's almost like you were looking at a solution in water and over a period of time, the elements in the solution begin to precipitate out and they be, and the heavier elements begin to drop down to the bottom of the jaw, right? If you've, uh, right, if you've ever made a bourbon old fashioned, if, you, if it sits long enough, the sugar in the old fashioned will go back to the bottom of the glass. Right? I've been practicing my cocktails uh, in this uh, period. David, can I share screen? Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now I have to find it. Okay. This is a example or a small piece of text from the first gate or the first section of Nefesh Um And obviously there are things that are, came before and things that come afterwards. So it's, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge for us to contextualize it, but I hope that it will give us an idea. So um, Rab Chaim says a Jew is a hybrid being both lowly and supernal, right? Sort of that's what I was kind of talking about. And he says, in relation to that which arose in God's will, that man of this lowest world be constructed in such a way that the supernal worlds are controlled by him. For it is known from the Zohar and the writings of Ari, that's the uh, rabbi, um, uh, da -da -da. Just the Arizal is Rabbi Isaac Luria in relation to the sequence of the hierarchical descent and the interconnections of the worlds, that the detail, arrangement, and behavior 
of every lower world is entirely dependent on the characteristics of the power of the world immediately above it. Okay, so the way in which the cosmos is formed is that each world is, con as, as each world emerges, it is controlled by the world immediately above it. That's the normal way in which the worlds um, um, emerge, right? Such that the upper worlds control the lower world like a soul does a body. And similarly, all the world's levels are connected in this sequence of level above level until they ultimately connect to God who is the source soul of them all. Uh, as per, and he quotes, with each world upper and lower from the secret originating upper point until the lowest of all the levels, each is the container of the next level, each one within the next. Uh, this is what I call the Russian doll theory of creation, right? Each world is nested in the world below it, right? Uh, and, 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 controlled, and, and controlled by the world above it, right? Um, and then he goes on and says, with all the lights interconnected with each, uh, et cetera. So each piece of the world that is descending, um, it is connected to the world above it, uh, etc. Right, and I'm going to skip a little of the next part, which is a little bit too um, um, difficult to to to, to, uh, to, um, to explain quickly. Um, but rather, get, I'm going to get to this point here. Therefore, right, the worlds are controlled. Okay, well, let me go a little bit up. Um, from the perspective of man's physical body, it is back, that is, it's the last in creation sequence, and is the lowest level in the hierarchy. And from the perspective of the supernal root of man's living soul, it is the front, the starting point, preceding the act of Merkava, and also the world of the throne of glory. These are references to um, mystical um, images of the divine, right? Um, and then he goes on to say, in addition, man's living soul is the secret of God's breath, so to speak. So um, this, this is um, the point at which he precisely articulates the idea that, hu that human beings are both um, the, the, uh, on a material level, they are the lowest element in creation, uh, but they have this breath of God within them that makes them higher even than the throne of glory, right? So that they are, in a certain sense, if you will, sitting next to God. Therefore, the worlds are controlled through man's actions which according to their inclination, whether good or bad, invoke the root of his supernal soul, which is above them and is the soul which enlivens them. When he moves, they move. When he stops, they stop. This is the meaning of what is said, that when the living soul was breathed into his nostrils, that, is high, that it is higher than the worlds and their inner essence, resulting in a man and the man becoming a living soul of all the worlds. This is similarly, similarly written by Rab Chaim Vital, that man's soul is the inner essence of everything, all right? So I will take that off for a second so I can see people a little easier. Um, this is a very short, but, but very um, characteristic selection from this text. Um, and there are a couple of parts of it, if you will, that I want to focus on and which ultimately is what I wanted to bring to your attention in this very brief overview. Number one, um, the, the idea of the, of the divine in this theology is not 
fundamentally different than contemporary ideas of process theology, right? The kind of theology which, which says God is not a noun, but God is a verb, right? God is a process. God is a, is a almost mechanical, albeit incomprehensible process, which um, precedes creation, right? So the Ein Sof is precedes creation, but precipitates creation. Let's call creation, for lack of a better term here, the Big Bang, right? The Big Bang happens and everything precipitates out of that moment, right? And it filters down further and further away from the source of the precipitation until it reaches uh, uh, the earth, let's say, and human habitation, right? So in a kind of remarkable coincidence, this theory of creation is, um, is, is not foreign to our concepts of what you might call secular evolution, right? But the evolution here is imbued with meaning. And the evolution is, is, um, is um, assumed to incorporate the second important aspect that I wanted to focus on, which goes back again to the very opening of the book of Bereshit, and that is that this process is called good, right? When God sees the world, he says it was good. When he sees human beings, he says they were very good, right? So there are two elements that form the basic structure of this approach to Jewish theology. One, that it is this almost incomprehensible cosmic process. And two, that this cosmic process is imbued with goodness. That its ultimate um, purpose is to imbue all of uh, the cosmos with goodness. And, that the re and then number three, it, remarkably enough, that the responsibility to enact the goodness that will in fact uh, power the universe is left to us, God forbid. Um, I mean, I don't know what God was thinking, but he left it to us, right? He imbued us with the power to, as Rav Chaim says, to control the cosmos uh, by virtue of our deeds. Right. So now for a second, a moment of going back to the biography. Rav Chaim of Volozhin, as I said, was a student of, of the Gaon of Vilna. Amongst the luminaries who graduated, uh, who were students of Rav Chaim himself in the Volozhin yeshiva, yeshiva, was a rabbi by the name of um, Rabbi Yosef Zundel of Salant. Rabbi Yosef Zundel of Salant, after leaving the Volozhin yeshiva, took the teaching of Chaim of Volozhin back with him to Salant, where he uh, uh, taught that, that system of thinking to his student, uh, Rabbi Yisrael, Yisrael Lipkin of Salant. And Rabbi Israel Lipkin of Salant codified, in a certain sense, um, the profound understanding that every act that a human being does has the power uh, to either contribute to the holiness of the entire cosmos or detract from it in a system of thought that uh, we, we come to call Musar, which as some of you know, I am somewhat involved in, right? So, the Musar movement and Musar literature in general is a um, is an is, is an extension of the uh, of the conclusions that one draws from the Kabbalistic system of theology. That is based on the Kabbalistic understanding of this essential point that human beings 
its play in the construction of, of being, construction of everything, right? The construction of existence, where we are the fulcrum in which the, the energy of the divine, the goodness of the divine is transposed and, and reinfused into the cosmos, assumably to ultimately reunite the cosmos with its source, right? Um, that this requires a constant process of moral and ethical edification and behavior, uh, which cannot occur accidentally, but must be cultivated in a um, disciplined spiritual process that Rav Salanter uh, created uh, called Musar. Um, so that's ultimately part of my interest in this. But secondarily, or maybe not so secondarily, uh, as I said at the beginning, the idea that ultimately it is the ethical impulse of, of, the, of human beings, which is at the heart of the Jewish experience, and that all of the mitzvot and all of the customs and all of the actions which we have created as a culture are intended as, not as ends in themselves, but as instruments of allowing us to, in fact, um, actualize the command, if you will, to um, sanctify or bring, bring goodness into the universe, right? That, that this is the sine qua non of most modern approaches to Jewish life, right? That the point of being Jewish, the reason to be Jewish, is that um, we have the power. The power is in our hands to create or to destroy the world, right? Um, and that no simplistic idea of God can be used to excuse human inaction, right? Human beings can't point to God and say, let him do it because that's a false God. Rather, the real religious imperative of being Jewish is to understand that God is pointing to you and saying, let you do it, right? Uh, your job is to, um, is to sanctify the universe and I have given you the tools to do so. So that's kind of my, um, my dual purpose in bringing your attention to Rabbi Chaim of Rajan, his Kabbalah, and the, the Musser technology, if you will, that is, um, that is, um, that, that is derived from, from, um, from this Kabbalistic vision. Okay, we got a few seconds left here for questions or comments. Rabbi, um, there, there seems to be something of a disconnect. I mean, I, the, the whole system as it evolves is, is very elegant and, and makes perfect sense and certainly couldn't dispute that human beings have the power to, to <laughs> create or destroy the world. I mean, that <laughs> we're making that very clear in the universe potentially. The, but going back to your initial comment is, is where I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. Um, which was that that the Ein Sof is fundamentally unknowable. It's it's making the connection between the ethical imperatives and what may or may not be God's will, since God is unknowable. How do you make that bridge? Um, well, that's an interesting question, and there are a variety of ways over the centuries in which different thinkers have tried to actually struggle with that question because you're right it's a it's the difficult it's the, the question of transcendence or imminence right is god part of the world or is god not part of the world um my reading of this system is that ultimately god is both right um, there there is there is the god that is beyond god that's not that you can't even call god 
uh, and then there is a, a an emanation of that God, right? Those lights. So you have the Ein Sof and you have the lights of the Ein Sof. And the lights of the Ein Sof um, precipitate the highest level of holiness in the universe, which is called Keter. So um, I, I the, 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 number one, the basic assumption, again, based on the biblical view, is that this whole process is part of what God calls good, right? So it is, it, it is as though the Ein Sof overflows itself with goodness and desires to be reunited with itself through the goodness of human beings, right? So in a sense, this then spills over into a kind of articulation of messianism, that, that in, in, in the world that we create out of our goodness, we will be reunited with the Ein Sof, so to speak, but the we who are reunited with the Ein Sof won't be we in the sense of individual consciousness because all individual consciousness requires ego and you can't have ego and the Ein Sof in the same place, right? So it's, a, it's really, it's a kind of mystical vision of union which is only accessible through a world united in goodness. Something like that. I don't know if that helps, but I think you're you're right. There is there is a little bit of a disconnect. Somebody else? Uh, right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you go. Um, how does this fit with the end of life when the soul leaves the body and goes on its journey? Well, the soul leaves the body, but it doesn't really go anywhere, right? It's part of the energy of the universe. And so it doesn't, um, it doesn't journey anywhere. It just remains part of the breath of God that is continually uh, sustaining the, 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 the material creation, right? So, so, you know, we have to, if you stop thinking of the soul as a personal possession and you start thinking of it as the infusion of a continuous, sort, a continuous flow of divine energy, then it doesn't go anywhere. It just is. Natalie, you have to unmute. This is going to be the, the slogan of a generation. You have to unmute. I, I have a question, Rabbi. Okay, Harris. I, I can't unmute Natalie, so we'll have to go on. Okay, Harris, I, go don't, on. I don't even see Natalie on here. That's but, okay. Uh, she may be on the next page. Um, I, will, I will unmute Natalie after Harris. Okay, uh, thank okay. you. Well, no, Natalie can go first. She can go first. Harris, okay. talk. All right, so my question is what you just said about what the soul is and you know, view it as an infusion of constant um, divine energy that even after you're physically gone, you know, it exists and infuses the rest of the world. How does that square with our you know, tefillot that we say at death and, and prayers, uh, may the soul of so-and-so I, it seems to me that those... Yeah, I get, your, I get it, I get it. Great, great question. So there are two answers. Number one, later on in the second book of uh, Nefesh Shechayim, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi uh, Chaim of Erosion goes to great lengths to denigrate what most people think is going on when they pray, right? Um, I think he would be the kind of person who, if he had a congregation, he wouldn't even allow you to say a Mishaberach. 
because that's kind of like an, it's like an idolatrous thing to think that God is going to come and heal people, right? For him, prayer is only one thing and one thing only. Meditation on the unity of God, right? Meditation on the, on the, on this, on the system, in which, which is God, right? So number one, it, 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 one answer is that prayer is misunderstood in all of its aspects, except insofar as it is a, it is an extended meditation on the absolute unity of God. But number two, and maybe more importantly, the point you raise brings up the difference between popular religion and, and, and intellectual religion, right? Rabbis can do all kinds of things and say all kinds of things, but that doesn't always fill the needs of people. And so, like I always say, I'm a theologian by profession, but I'm never a theologian at the cemetery, the hospital, the sickbed, etc. right? My role in those places is not to help people think better, but to help people feel better, right? And I think that a lot of Jewish liturgy is developed to help people feel better and is not necessarily consistent with theological niceties. Simple as that. Okay, Natalie. Uh, we are the creator and the creation. We are the creation and the transformer, I prefer to say. Right? We don't create the universe, but we have the power to transform it. Okay, I think I'm out of time. Uh, I, I, I um, thank you for your attention. Um, it's past my bedtime, so I won't be staying up with the, for the rest of the shiurim, but I, I'm sure they will be wonderful, and I hope that you will enjoy that, and I'll see you in the morning at Sinai. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Rabbi Stone. Uh, it's been, a, again, a pleasure to learn with you. And um, uh, and you're going to be on in five minutes. We're going to have you start at nine o'clock. Um, so uh, this is your chance to uh, grab something to eat or drink or, um, you know, add a layer of clothing or not or whatever you need at this time. Um, and uh, feel free also, uh, you know, uh, in the meantime, to unmute and socialize uh, during the break, and we'll come back to uh, Ann Albert at nine o'clock. And it's been great to see so many faces that I haven't seen for months. So, um, just just nice to see people's faces, and, and 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 I wish more people who have got themselves their their video off would show their faces because I like to see faces. Hi, Arlene. Hi, Sabrina. Tanya. I'll stay on for a few minutes to socialize. Good. Can I ask one more question or are we past that? You can ask what's, you know, there's no it's, rules. It's a simple one. So, who's, who's speaking? So, Sam Gordon. Okay. Don't know where I am on your screen. So, I'll get you. If, if, in my understanding of Nefesh Ahayim, it says that, that, that God is, is this large energy. And, and we're, in the image of God, we're a small energy. And so he, we are created in his image because we're created as energy, but we are, we are much smaller with much less vision. And in one measure, we, he's in the fourth dimension, can see all, and we're in the third dimension and we're limited. So it also seems that, that like we're in, we're in our body, we are, the soul wears our body as clothes mm -hmm. and we're here to prove our worth to return to heaven. But do you see it that way? Um, well, I mean, I think that there's, a, there's always going to be what I call the language problem, right? What do you mean by heaven? What do you mean by, you know, the, the, in other words, I don't see... Uh, in fact, later on in, in, the, in, this, in this part of the book, he talks about the fact that Olam Hazeh, I'm sorry, Olam Abba, the world to come, was not created at creation, but rather is built by the actions of human beings. Human beings 
build their own world to come. Yes. And, right. So, so you know, the, he's. I, I think you have to try to be sympathetic to the fact that he is struggling to use a, a almost a plethora of metaphors to describe that which is almost indescribable. Um, and there, and and at any point that you start to reify any of the metaphors, you begin to actually lose the power of his thought, right? So, so I mean, even when he uses the word God, I mean that's just not an adequate word. Is he using Yud Hey Vav Hey? Is he using Elohim, which he definitely distinguishes between? Is he referring to Ein Sof, which is perhaps even before Yud Hey Vav Hey? I mean, the complexity of his thought is is almost crippled by the paucity of human language, even the most metaphoric language. Right. So, yeah. So I would. So the question you ask has too many words that need to be unpacked in order to be able to be answered. Well, Miriam Webster this year, the word of the year was a singular um, use of the word they. Correct. And I think that is probably one of the best words to express God. Um, you know, people are worried of male or female, you know, but they is a, is a better understanding of this unknowing energy. That's really a great thought. I hadn't thought of that, and I would commend it. Uh, we should start talking about God, not as he or she, but as they. I think that's great. Um, it, and it works, right? It works with a lot of this kind of stuff. But thank you. Anyway, I'll get out of the way here so things can move on. All right, and we, uh, we'll start in just a minute. I am so pleased that... Um, I'm so pleased that uh, we have uh, Dr. Ann Albert with us this evening. Um, Ann is the Director of Public Programs at the Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies, uh, also a BZBI member.